So um, one more relationship that I need to highlight is the uh, mass luminosity relationship. And to put together chart like this, it takes two entirely separate pieces of detective work. Um, in, to, in order to figure out luminosity, um, other than standard candles, you need to figure out the distance to the stars so that from the apparent brightness, you can calculate the luminosity. Um, the, you know, apparent brightness and distance together gives you enough information to calculate the luminosity. And to figure out the mass, you actually have to find the special types of stars, uh, binary stars, where you can figure out their orbital period. Um, once you have that, then that gives you enough information to calculate the stellar masses. And uh, this part, I think I actually kind of skipped a little bit when we were doing Kepler's law. You can read about it if you want. Um, uh, let me uh, let me be clear. <laughs> what I mean, I we skipped. Uh, it's a, a formula that's in your textbook that I didn't like, so I didn't cover it. Um, and, but I didn't like it for unit reasons, so I didn't cover it. And uh, later on, I see that they uh, the authors use it quite a bit more. So yeah, the laws of planetary motion. I think it's the third section there and uh, or the very last section yeah this one uh, I, so this well this formula and uh, later on they refer to this again uh, with the newton's um, i think the newton's law of universal gravitation um, yeah, this formula here, it's their modification using Newton's law. And I didn't cover this because frankly, unit wise, this is a mess because you have to be very specific on how you specify these units. A has to be in uh, the astronomical unit and P has to be in units of uh, e one year. So, um, but uh, this is, uh, but this is the method that if you have an object that's orbiting something else, or if you have a binary star where two stars are orbiting each other, uh, this expression allows you to figure out their mass. If you know the orbital size, the size, and you know the orbital period, then you can work backward to figure out the, the mass of the orbiting objects. So we do those two pieces of detec detective work um, figuring out the luminosity and mass. This is what, uh, what they noticed, that there seems to be a relationship between the mass of a star and how bright, uh, how luminous it is, how much light it outputs. And, uh, and it's a linear relationship. And I think when, uh, when you look at the standard solar model, it kind of makes sense that the more massive stars would be more luminous because uh, they can produce greater pressure in the core and more gravitational pull, so greater pressure in the core. So they can have nuclear fusion going on in bigger parts of the star. Um, so it makes sense. And this is the relationship that they observe. And, um, and with this uh, in, um, with this in mind, it helps us uh, understand the other relationship that was noticed um, earlier on, which is the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. It, uh, um, it is something that people noticed as they were plotting the luminosity of star, the same thing um, as what was on the previous plot here. And on the x-axis, instead of mass, they had the spectral class. As in, um, so these were based on the, the uh, I guess <laughs> the, what it boils down to is the surface temperature of the star. That's what spectral class directly relates to. They noticed that most of the stars uh, fit a pattern. They fit into this line that uh, they, this, this is what they call main sequence because that's where most of the stars were, but they had uh, exceptions, a grouping here, a grouping here. And the, the achievement or the outcome of the stellar evolution that you see discussed in the previous module and the, um, and the module, submodule 
is um, understanding how how everything fits into this. Um, how uh, from the beginning, where the stars reach main sequence, how as they burn out their nuclear fusion fuel, they uh, go on to become a super giant or, or become giants, red giants. And when they burn out the remaining fuel in that stage of life, then they go uh, move on to the dwarf stage. And, um, and uh, this is the diagram that will help, help you see what, um, help you see all that process. This is the tool that can be used to illustrate those processes kind of passes on this diagram. So um, let's see. Yeah, um, paths on this diagram. And uh, in the next sub-module uh, goes through the observational evidence for uh, for thinking about stellar evolution that way. Let me just, uh, um, let me just uh, show you that, uh, show you that slide. Um, I mainly the, the Hertz uh, HR diagram of um, HR diagram of a star clusters where you where um, all the stars within the cluster started out at about the same time. So um, yeah, so this is just uh, uh, so this is just uh, uh, touching back to the standard solar model. Um, what happens? Um, uh, what happens as the the fusion occurs in the in the in the sun in the star, um, the the fusion projects kind of gather in the core. So over time, the uh, the core of our sun will be more helium filled than hydrogen filled, and yeah. So um, so this this is based on our model of our sun, the standard solar model, and the and this is still model based, and the observational basis that we have are the HR diagrams, again, luminosity and surface temperature of, of star clusters. These are a group of stars that started out at about the same time. And with the young clusters, you see most of stars on the main sequence, or maybe for these stars, they haven't quite reached the main sequence yet what we think will happen over next millions of years is that these stars will contract, contract and um, start nuclear fusion and will be on main sequence. Um, and we say this is a young cluster because we see that none of these stars have burned out their fusion fuel and went on to become uh, a, a red giant or even the, the white dwarfs. And and we know that we should eventually get stars like that because when we look at other clusters that we think are older, then we we do see those stars that have become red giants. So it, the stars that are here now, we think they were uh, on this part of main sequence before, and they move to, on to be red giants as they burn out their uh, nuclear fuel and. Um, going to that later stage of a stellar evolution. And so uh, there's a term, I think it's also one of your key terms, main sequence turnoff. It gives you the estimate of the age of the star clusters. Uh, and um, it, uh, it, it's uh, one of the uh, observational evidence that we have for our models of a stellar evolution. And I guess this is the question I got, was it almost a week ago? about, you know, uh, like, how do we know <laughs> our sun will last for another uh, on, another few billion years is, so we have a model that predicts that our sun will have nuclear fu uh, fusion fuel for like eight to 10 billion years. And based on our um, um, radioactive dating of primitive rocks, we think our solar system is about 4 billion years old. So if our model is right, then um, then we should have another 4 billion years or so left. And what we see with the other stars gives us some confidence that our model is 
probably right-ish. I mean, there's always gonna be some things that can be corrected, some adjustments that can be made, but it's a question of, is it even in the ballpark? And um, yeah. So, and, and uh, I just wanted to emphasize again, the importance of the HR diagram in illustrating things like this. Uh, it's a uh, uh, HR diagram is the canvas where uh, of the luminosity and surface temperature where you can chart the life cycle of a star. Um, so with that, I'm gonna leave the remainder of the slides to you. Um, that's uh, kind of covering the white dwarf and uh, the type 1A, type 2 and type 1A supernova. And I think you can, <laughs> again, <laughs> these slides are meant to stand there on their own. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions, but um, I, unless there are questions, I would like to res reserve the remainder of the time 